Look, I talk a lot about side hustles and I give a lot of step-by-step -step guides. I think in what I'm calling the great reset, everyone is going to need to learn some of these side hustling skills, whether it's how to do marketing in this new world or how to set up blogs or websites or a little bit of both. I really love what this one company is doing, learn.com, L-U-R-N.com. Their whole point is it's easy for you to learn these skills. Once you learn the skills, you could start making money almost immediately. So what I want people to do is check out this free on-demand workshop. My friend Anik Singal is giving the workshop. The workshop is specifically set aside for you guys, my listeners, and Anik is going to show you how to launch and scale an online business with nothing more than an email address. So if you're dropped in the middle of a desert and all you've got is an email address and an internet connection, Anik is going to tell you how to make a sizable business from it. Not just a side hustle, but a business. And he's going to show you how to generate passive income simply by mailing affiliate offers from smart marketers around the world. So I've described affiliate deals a little bit in the past, um, but if you don't know what they are, it's an excellent way to make money using a blog or email marketing or Twitter or whatever. So Anik has this specific free on-demand workshop to discover how to, how to do this, how to use your email address to build a significant income side hustle that can generate thousands of month in passive income go to www.learn, L-U-R-N, dot com slash Altucher. That's www.learn, learn dot com slash Altucher. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Welcome to another episode of Side Hustle Fridays. And I have to say, I am loving this series. We started it off two weeks ago talking about everything you possibly could need to know about online newsletters. I'll probably do a follow up on that one in a month or two with basically a bunch of newsletter ideas and how to market newsletters and so on. Meanwhile, last week we did 30 day book challenges meaning I would give an idea about how to write a book in 30 days. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. But why do I like this? Why do I think it's a legit side hustle and so on? First off, I'll summarize a little bit from last week. The idea of a book, the definition of a book has changed. You no longer have to write a 300 page book. You know, it used to be book publishers would only publish 300 page books because that's what bookstores like Barnes and Noble wanted. But now on Amazon, I know plenty of people who have written massive, massive best-selling books that are 20 pages, 30 pages, 40 pages. I mentioned my friend Kamal Ravikant's book, uh, Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends On It, which he first wrote in 2011, self-published it. It's only 8,000 words, 300 pages a word. That's less than 30 pages. That sold about a million copies. And anybody can do it. He wrote the book and uploaded it into Amazon, created a Kindle, a paperback, I think an audio book in just a few weeks. Choose yourself. My book wasn't written in 30 days that it was self-published though. I did the Kindle. I did the paperback. I did the hardcover. I did the audio book, sold close to a million copies. Self-publishing is a legit way to make a lot of money. And it's a good spoke in what I call the spoke and wheel approach meaning the wheel is a basic idea. Like let's say your basic idea is you love golfing and then the different spokes could be a podcast about golfing, a newsletter about golfing, a book about it, uh, and on and on and on, coaching or uh, whatever. There's two reasons why I love these 30-day book challenges or three reasons. Let me just say three reasons. First is I know several people who have not only written one best-selling book by self-publishing in just a few weeks, but I know a couple of people who have made this their business. So Steve Scott, he's been on my podcast twice and I've mentioned him before. That guy has over a hundred books or more. He, I know he writes under several pseudonyms. He writes so many books. They're all small books. I'll read off a couple of his titles. 
Um, I'm looking them up right now on Amazon. Here's one, how to write a nonfiction book in 21 days. Here's one, Declutter Your Mind. That's written by S.J. Scott, one of his pseudonyms. Here's one called Habit Stacking, How to Stop Procrastinating, 10-Minute Mindfulness, Weight Loss Mastery, The Budgeting Habit, Mastering Evernote. These are entire books. He's selling them all for either $2.99 or $3.99. Here's one, Smart Goals Made Simple, 10 Steps to Master Your Personal and Career Goals. It's got 122 reviews. This one, Declutter Your Mind, has 962 reviews. So these books are doing well. They're selling. He's Let's say he has 100 books. I know at his peak, and, and this was several years ago. I haven't spoken to him in about two or three years, actually. I know then he was making about $60,000 a month from his self-published books. How does the math add up? Well, let's say on average you make, I don't know, $500 a book. Okay, just on average, $500 a book. If you do my 30-day book challenges, once you start getting in stride with this, you could quickly get to 100 books. Let's say on average, each book sells $500 worth a month. So at $3.99, that's about 120, 130 books a month. Not so difficult. Some books, by the way, I'm saying that's an average. Some books might sell 10 books a month. Some books might sell zero, but other books might sell 1,000 books a month, particularly your newer books. So 500 books a month is not unreasonable. But after 100 books, that's $50,000 a month or 600000 a year, and it's an ongoing income stream. So some months, I'm sure Steve doesn't sell any books. Now, I was looking around, and I found another guy. I've, written, I've talked about him before. I should probably get this guy on my podcast, Patrick King. I don't know how many books he's written. It's like an infinite number of pages to find out all his books. Uh, there's one, I actually just bought this one, Learn to Think Using Riddles, Brain Teasers, and Wordplay. So that's basically just a book of puzzles he found online, is my assumption. Here's another one, The Science of Getting Started, uh, How to Beat Procrastination, Summon Productivity, and Stop Self-Sabotage. Here's another book, Improve Your Conversations. Here's another one, Improve Your People Skills. Here's another one, Stop People Pleasing. Here's another one, I, this is one I need, I'm gonna buy this one too, Better Small Talk and it's $3.99. So I'm gonna click on that one. It's got 23 reviews. Let's see, the reviews are, they're, they're five-star reviews, mostly five-star reviews. And looks to me like he's selling probably a couple hundred bucks a month of this one. You know what? And I'm just gonna buy it right now. Oh, here's one, The Art of Witty Banter. Should probably do that one too. Meanwhile, this guy has written hundreds of books, so you know he's making some money on it, and who knows what other income sources he's using off this. Then I think, I'm not totally sure, I think this is his girlfriend, Zoe McKay. Again, I'm not sure. Uh, I have no idea. I, I Someone might have told me that at some point, but she's got a ton of books. I don't know how many books she has. Here's one, Think in Systems. Uh, that one has 45 reviews. Here's the uh, Daily Habit Makeover. Here's the Unshakable Resilience. Another book, The One-Page Budgeting Plan. Become debt-free, accumulate savings, build wealth investing, and live life on your terms. Here's one, Stretch Your Mind. So she's got quite a few books out there. It's three pages of books. Let's see what, I'm gonna go to page three. The Art of Minimalism, four strategies to simplify your life just as much as you want. Here's Wired for Confidence. How to learn to handle judgment, act against your fears, and toughen up your own life. So you see, People are doing this 30-day book strategy and they're making a living at it. If you, it, you know, you could have two choices. You could write a book, maybe one, maybe two, and you can use that for several things. You can say, look, you should hire me to consult for your firm. I wrote this book. Or you could say, hey, I could speak at your conference or I could speak at your TED Talk. I wrote this book. If anybody is deciding between two speakers, one wrote a book and the other didn't, they're gonna pick the person who wrote a book. So the book is like almost a, the new kind of business card in today's society. It's it's another way of expressing yourself and it's got a lot of uh, people respect people who write books and, and it shows you put in the time and the commitment to do the research and and so on. Now, so, so there's a lot of reasons to write a book. One is to make a good living like Steve Scott and perhaps Patrick King and Zoe McKay. Another is to just add to your 
your spokes in, in the wheel of what you do. So it adds to your ability to do coaching, consulting, public speaking, a podcast, whatever. Another reason to write a book is to just, you know, and this is one Tucker Max first told me, but it really resonated with me. I have no idea who my great, great grandparents are. I, hear little stories that are about a sentence long and that's it. Like I know one great, great, great grandmother came from the Europe to the U S by hiding in a suitcase. So, cause she didn't have a ticket, a $1 ticket to get to New York. So I would like to know her story because nobody was writing books. Then there was no Amazon. You couldn't self publish. You needed a major publisher. She did not write a book. I will never hear a story. So one reason to write a book, is just to let your great, great, your descendants, let them know who you are, tell your story. Your story is gonna disappear in the sands of time, to use a cliche, and you might as well resurface occasionally and have your story told. And again, when you write a book, don't just think of it as an ebook when you self-publish. Do a paperback, do an ebook, do a hardcover, do an audiobook, who knows, do a trailer for your book. I'll get to marketing your book on another episode, not the next episode, probably in a couple of months when I'm neck deep in marketing my own next book and I'll describe in depth what I'm doing. But suffice it to say, the two best methods for marketing your book is write an interesting book and write your second book. Because if your second book's a bestseller, people will read your first book. So last week, well, let me just tell you the structure. What, what makes something a 30 day book challenge? Number one, most important rule, the book can be done in a month. And I'm going to describe how. Two, the book does not have to be big. 30 to 50 pages is fine for a self-published book, just as long as it's interesting. Three, there should be many opportunities for sequels and other income potential, like I described before. But what do I mean by sequels? Well, remember that book, um, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff? Now, I remember... Richard Carlson, he wrote another book called You Can Be Happy, Five Principles for Keeping Life in Perspective. All right, maybe that's an okay title, maybe not, but nobody bought it. And so he came up with a much simpler approach. And that was a very, that was like almost an academic book about how to be happy. It was like all his theories, psychological theories about how to be happy. And it was big, long chapters and nobody bought it. But then he wrote, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. And the subtitle is, uh, and it's all small stuff, simple ways to keep the little things from taking over your life. Oh, that looks like a nice little book. You open it up. It's like every chapter is just one page long. And so that became a bestseller, sold millions of copies. And then he wrote hundreds of books. He, he wrote, uh, don't sweat the small stuff for parents. Don't sweat the small stuff for senior citizens. Don't sweat the small stuff for kids. Don't sweat the small stuff for lawyers. Don't sweat and on and on and on. Don't sweat your finances. And he made it a franchise. So that's what I mean by sequels. When you can make something a franchise, it doesn't have to be, but it, you know, that's always good. So that was the third point I was making. The fourth is even if your book idea is not great, it gets you going and it can create an interesting book. So I'll describe that in some of these 30 day book challenges I will talk about today. And the book should be easy to market. So don't sweat the small stuff. Let's just take that as an example. He could take that book. He could go to his local bookstore and say, Hey, here's 10 copies of my book. Don't sweat the small stuff. Can we just put it? it it's a demand purchase. Everybody, nobody wants to sweat the small stuff. Can we just put it right next to the cash register? And probably most of them said yes. By the way, a very interesting story. I haven't covered this one before, but Wayne Dyer has written he has sold over a hundred million copies of his books. If you haven't heard of him, he's a massive self-help author. He's recently passed away in the past few years. He used to um, do these PBS. You know how PBS, the television station would be raising money and he would talk for hours, you know, encouraging people to donate money to PBS, public broadcasting. And he would describe the contents of his books in his speeches. And that was a great way for him to market the book. But he was a professor at St. John's University. He had just self-published his book. Uh, I think it was called the, uh, I, I don't want to, I don't want to bastardize it. So let me look it up. Wayne Dyer, D-Y-E-R. I've actually interviewed him on, I think my, the second or third episode of my podcast and I was so nervous, uh, but he was su such an impressive guy. 
Yeah, it was called Your Erroneous Zones. That was his first book, self-published. He published it on August 1st, 1976. One of the top selling books of all time. Sold 35 million copies. Spent 64 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. But here's what he did. At first, nobody was buying Your Erroneous Zones. And he really believed in it. He really believed in the message. So he quit his job quit his job as a tenured professor of St. John's University. So now, just so you know, tenured professor means you cannot get fired. This was like the cushiest job in the world, and he had this job for life if he wanted it. He quit that job. He piled a bunch of, of his self-published books in the back of his car, and this is when self-publishing did have a stigma. It does not anymore, but it did then. He had to print up the books himself. Now Amazon does all the printing for you. It's print on demand. He loaded up all these books in his the trunk of his car and he drove around the country going to every bookstore and selling the books. And that was how he did 35 million copies in sales. So again, you know, there's a history to this. Uh, you know, people have done it. A lot of famous authors who you don't realize have started out self-published. Wayne Dyer is one of them. Louise Hayes, another self-help writer, has written over, sold over 150 million copies of her books. Her first several books were self-published. She was self-publishing so much, she started her own publishing company, Hay House, which actually published one of my books, The Power of No. E.L. James, Fifty Shades of Grey, that started off as a self-published book. The Martian by Andy Weir, who was on my podcast, that started off as a self-published book. A lot more books than you think are self-published. The other reason I wanted to write a book, and I'll just be honest about this, when I was just 22 years old, I was, I had nothing to do for the summer. I was just hanging out and I met this girl that I was, I, had, I just had a crush on this girl. I think she actually ended up writing for The Simpsons much later. I, I think I saw her name on the credits once, but had a crush on her, but she liked this guy who was like this, you know, pseudo intellectual college kind of guy. He was always talking about Ulysses by James Joyce and Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon. Two books, by the way, that I find completely unreadable, but I would try to read them. And he had like long hair that he was always flipping back over his eyes and he just like reeked of cool. And he was always, you know, he always had a pen and a pad in his hand. He, he called himself a writer. I never saw him write one word. I'm not meaning to put him down. Uh, we, we actually ended up being roommates, but I will say I was incredibly jealous that they were dating and I wanted to be a writer after that. That actually put me over the top and I wanted to be a writer and then I got obsessed. And you know what? 30 years later, Robin, my wife, she wanted to meet me because she read my book, Choose Yourself. And she arranged to meet me at a conference I was speaking at and then we were friends for a while and then eventually we started dating. So my dream came true. The reason for writing a book came true for me. And, you know, and I've loved writing ever since. I've written, you know, quite a few books. I have another book coming out in February and there's two or three. I always say, that's it. I'm not gonna write another book. I'm done with books for a while. And now I have three new, new ideas for books. But anyway, the 30 day book challenge. Last week, I talked about two of them. One was, uh, I, I kind of call this one the 10 scientifically proven ways to blank and you fill in the blank and I describe uh, what I mean in, in, in last week's episode. And by the way, when I describe these 30 day book challenges, there's another important criteria is that everyone listening to this and let's say there's hundreds of thousands listening to this, everyone listening to this could do the exact same idea and you will all write different books. So if I gave you a much more specific outline, that wouldn't be true. But you'll see if you listen to last week's episodes or if you listen to it, you know that you could write literally 100,000 books based on the outline I gave last week. Another one I gave, uh, I call it the religion 30-day uh, book challenge technique. And it's the idea of taking a classic text like uh, the Tao Te Ching or the Bible or uh, Buddhism's Four Noble Truths, or uh, the 195 Yoga Sutras, or the, the Analects of Confucius, or there's all sorts of books related to the art of war, like the six strategies of 
battle success or whatever, take one of those religious texts and map it one-to-one on a modern idea. And there's examples of this, like Zen in the art of archery, Zen in the art of motorcycle maintenance, the Tao of Pooh, the inner game of tennis. Again, just from me describing it, you could probably already figure out, but everybody could write, could take one of these book challenges and come up with their completely own different book. And I'll give you some examples because I've described some of these book challenges in the past. Some people have written books. And if you write one of these books from these book challenges, I'm about to get four new 30 day book challenges. But if you write any of these books, I will talk about, I will, I will read the title at least on one of these podcasts and congratulate you. So a couple people sent me their, uh, the titles of their books and the links on Amazon. I bought all the books. So here's a couple. Uh, one is this guy, Daniel Yoon, using a technique that I'm going to describe today, but this is also related to the 10 scientifically proven habits technique. This book is called 67 cognitive biases that can help your business make more money. Boom. I love this. You'll see why, cause I'm going to describe this technique a little bit more today, but he took If you just look on Wikipedia for cognitive biases, you'll see a list of hundreds of cognitive biases and cognitive biases are shortcuts in thinking that could sometimes be manipulated by those who are aware of them. He did idea sex between that and how do you make more money and boom, 67 cognitive biases that can help your business make more money. You know, you can also use cognitive biases to persuade people. So someone could do that, or you can do cognitive biases to win a political campaign, or you could understand, you know, here are the cognitive biases used by Napoleon, Einstein, um, Elon Musk, Abraham Lincoln. You could take a historical look and uh, that's also educational and, and how to. So, so great job, Daniel. And I hope you continue it. And by the way, I, I bought the book. I haven't gotten it yet, but I started reading it on Kindle. It's, it's really excellent. I'll describe more on a future podcast at some point. Here's another one. Uh, Wally Salinger wrote a book called Move. Your brain needs it. And he used the technique from last week because the subtitle is Scientifically Proven Habits That Turbocharge Your Brain, Help You Learn Faster, and Live a Long, Extraordinary Life. And the book is titled Move, and I could tell he did the exact technique that I described last week. He's writing his second book this month. He says to me that the next book is called Sleep. Staying awake is driving you mad. 10 scientifically proven habits to improve your sex drive, creativity, mood, and productivity. Wally, I cannot wait for that book to come out. That's one of my favorite topics, sleeping, combined with my other favorite topics, sex drive, creativity, and mood. Uh, Let's see. There's also another book sent to me. Oh, yes. uh, uh, Abby Ferry. Uh, She's been reading my stuff since almost a decade now. And she wrote a book this past month called The Safety Habit. And it was such an intriguing topic. Like there's all these situations where you want to be safer, like whether it's kids in a kitchen or yourself, if you work in a factory or, you know, now particularly this is so important with uh, the coronavirus around. So she wrote all about, uh, she basically took a bunch of different situations where safety is important and it's not necessarily obvious. And she wrote how to build a habit of safety. And by the way, Abby, if you're listening to this, what I really love about this book and all your diagrams and descriptions and methodologies is that I thought there was a lot of analogies to other situations in life, like relationships or business or how to reduce risk in investing and and so on. So I think there's potential uh, sequel to the safety habit. Here's another person who wrote uh, uh, using one of last week's techniques uh, we, this is a friend of mine and we talked about this technique a couple of months ago and he wrote the book, but it's called the stoic salesman by Brendan lemon. So Brendan is professionally a salesman and he's a very good one. And stoicism is, a, a ancient Greek philosophy, uh, Seneca, Epictetus, uh, Socrates, all were stoics. And Ryan Holiday writes a lot about Stoicism. He, he wrote a book called Obstacles the Way, all about Stoicism. He has a new book coming out about Stoicism. He's going to come on the podcast within the next month to talk about it. But uh, Brendan basically combined the idea of the you know 2,000 year old philosophy of Stoicism, which we know is a successful thing to write about because 
there were hundreds or even thousands of philosophies back then, and Stoicism is one of the most famous, so we know it's been focus grouped by history. So we know that if we write about Stoicism and apply it in a modern context, then it will be successful. So he applies Stoicism to getting better at sales, and it's a great book. I'm going to have him on the podcast to talk about Stoic sales at some point. So he used the technique, and I know for a fact, because he gave me updates every day, I know for a fact he wrote it in about 20 days, and then he got a cover for it, and he uploaded it to Amazon. I have the paperback. He uploaded a Kindle paperback. I think he's working on an audio book. He did the whole thing in 30 days on the dot. So these are these are just a few examples. I'll provide more. Um, whenever you do one of these, I will mention it. No matter what the topic of the podcast is, I will mention your book. So let's finally get to four more 30-day book challenges. So here's here we go. This is the very first one that I ever uh, described. This one is the 101 book technique. So I think this is what above Daniel Yoon, when he wrote 67 Cognitive Biases to help your business make more money, I think he used the 101 technique and got to 67, which is fine. So I call this the 101 book. Pick any area of life you're interested in going down the rabbit hole on the internet and researching and so on. So maybe you like conspiracies or maybe you like entrepreneurship or maybe you like politics and the government. Maybe you like, uh, you want to learn how to be happier. Who knows? But you're going to do 101 strange and unusual things you need to know about blank. Let's say you want to write, uh, I don't know about entrepreneurship. 101 unusual things you need to know about entrepreneurship. Number one, the average billionaire has five different sources of income, according to the IRS. And so you could cite, you know, whatever IRS document says this, and it's, you know, that's an easy Google search away. And what's unusual about this is that a lot of times people say entrepreneurs need to focus. Well, it turns out entrepreneurship is just one source of income. So you still need to think even your business maybe needs alternative sources of income. So who knows? Number two, only 30% of startups fail according to the small business administration. Why is that unusual? Because everyone always says, whenever I say, oh, I want to start a business, people say, oh, you know, 90% of businesses fail. That is just not true. 90% of, let's say, Silicon Valley venture capital funded startups fail. But if you start a laundromat, it's chances are you're not going to fail. Your chances are you'll make a decent profit if it's in a good location or if you buy a laundromat using the techniques I described in my podcast with Carl Allen, where we talk about how you could structure a deal so you put almost no money into it. But only 30% of startups fail according to the Small Business Administration, et cetera. You write 101 things. Again, just write a paragraph or two. Tell maybe another a one-paragraph story or give a couple a, a couple examples with a few sentences. And write 10 unusual things about whatever area you pick each day. You write maybe why they're unusual. You explain it a little more. Maybe you write one or two little stories. It doesn't have to be long. Just write a couple of paragraphs. Write a page a day. You know, write 10 things a day. So you write 10 of these pages. Maybe they're two pages. Who knows? You can write a little bit less some days. And then that gives yourself time to you know, use 99designs.com or Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R.com to make the cover. Neither of them are sponsoring my podcast. I think, I think 99designs did sponsor the podcast at one point, but they are not currently a sponsor, but I've used them for, for covers of books and stuff. So then you go to kdp.amazon.com, you upload it to Amazon, you hit publish, you say, make it a paperback and boom, you have a paperback, you have uh, a, a Kindle and do an audio book if you want, I would recommend it, and so on. So that's, you know, each item, by the way, in this 101 technique, each item should surprise you as in, boy, I wish someone had told me that. Or, you know, you want, basically, I didn't know that is the ideal response 
for each item on your list. And when you have 101 items, you have the first draft of your book. And remember, uh, like, like for instance, when I told you only 30% of starters fail as opposed to 90%, I didn't know that before I read it. So you, you aim to surprise with each one of these things. Just so I'll give some other quick examples. 101 secrets the government is keeping from you. So if the president, here's, here's number one. If the president is in New York City and there's a terrorist attack, the president always stays at the Waldorf Astoria. By the way, I don't know if Trump does because he's got his own set of buildings there, but the Waldorf Astoria has a secret basement where there's all sorts of secret tunnels that takes the president all the way to Grand Central and he quickly gets on a private train to DC or wherever. So that's why there's this whole labyrinth maze of, of uh, tunnels underneath the Waldorf story for this reason. Here's, here's number two, want to avoid taxes and live in a beautiful vacation spot? The US Virgin Islands has a top federal tax rate of 3.35% instead of the top federal tax rate of 39% in, in the US, so in the States. So again, these are just a couple of ideas. Uh, go for it and pick your favorite topic, whether, who knows, whether it's cooking, 101 secrets about cooking or 101 secrets about sports or 101 secrets about making a hit song. Uh, who knows, 101 secrets about you. And that could be for your descendants. 101 secrets about persuasion. You know, this should require some research and you should find unusual things that surprise you. you could do 101 strange things, strange ways to be happier. I, I did a little bit of a Google and I didn't know that this, here's this one technique that works. If you say E for an entire 60 seconds, you will reduce stress. It'll, it contorts the facial muscles around your mouth the way a smile does. So there's a lot of research that says actions precede emotions and that even fake smiling will convince your body to have the emotion of happiness. So that's a strange way to be happier. Uh, 101 small habits will bring you success. 101 parenting tricks your parents never taught you. 101 things you wish you learned in college. 101 magic tricks you can learn in five minutes, on and on. And you see again, 100,000 people listening potentially, then it's 100,000 different books that could come out. All could be done in a month. It's really important that people learn the skills that are gonna be required in what I'm calling the great reset, this period that we're beginning to experience right now. And I wanna tell you about my friend, Anik. So in 2008, Anik Singal was $1.7 million in debt and his company was on the verge of collapsing. I think we got along because he kind of reminds me of myself. And his mistake was he had forgotten one of the golden rules of being an entrepreneur, stick with what's working. So after a few bad business deals, Anik finally returned to a simple five-step program he used to launch his business in the first place. He dug himself out of the hole. His first year doing this, he booked $10 million a year in sales and he has never looked back. I am really impressed with him. And he is going to give a free workshop to my listeners only to teach what he did because it is pot. People use side hustles, this side hustle, that what you really want to do is build a business with as little work as possible. And I know this because I'm lazy, but I love building businesses that keep me independent, that let me do what I want, that let me pursue my passions. So today his system, Anik's system is responsible for over $250 million in sales. And he's taught it to over 30,000 people worldwide. People like uh, Kane, who used this system to generate over $20,000 a month in passive income, or Daniel was able to quit his nine to five job just four months after discovering Anik's system. And Ippo, one of Anik's students in Greece who makes $8,000 a month or more using a simple five-step system, the system Anik is teaching people. So what they and many others have discovered is the ultimate side hustle, a way to launch a business today with nothing more than an email address and a mentor to show you the way. 
I always suggest to learn something, you need a plus minus equal, a mentor or virtual mentor to teach you, a minus, so for someone for you to teach and equals people who are struggling with you. You exchange notes and you learn from them. Everybody is struggling right now. This is an opportunity to learn skills. You could show others and you could build up, build up your wealth, not just make $8 an hour walking dogs or delivering food. This is the real deal. I know, Anik, it's the skills I wish I had known back in 2008. So for listeners of my show today, Anik has recorded a very special workshop just for you. And you have to go to this specific URL because it's just for you. So discover how to use your email address to build an income generating business that can generate thousands a month in passive income. Go to www.learn.com slash altature. That's L-U-R-N, learn, L-U-R-N, www.learn.com slash altature. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken 
comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180-plus Masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180-plus Masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. Here's another, the next 30 day book challenge. And I'll just start to go through these a little bit more quickly. Here's one I call smart enough to vote. And uh, by the way, I had described this one a few months ago to some people and one guy, uh, one guy did it uh, that, I, that I know of at least, maybe more did it, uh, Emmett Ferguson. And let me see, I wrote his book down, but let me see if I can find it. Emmett Ferguson, and he also mentioned it in the Choose Yourself. Oh yeah, it's called Get Political, 35 Research Issues to Consider Because the World Needs Your Voice. And he wrote the book in 30 days. Let me see how many pages it is. I bought it and it's sitting downstairs. It's 115 pages. He wrote it in 30 days because when something is very heavily outlined, like all of these are structured to be, you can write much more quickly than you ever thought you would be able to write. So in any case, here's the 30-day the book challenge that I call Smart Enough to Vote. Most people have no idea what the issues are. So like everybody's like, oh, Biden is a communist. Trump is a fascist. Like everybody's arguing all day long on Twitter and Facebook. But I can guarantee you, oh, well, what is, how does Biden stand on one of the most important economic issues uh, in the country, tariffs. That was the issue Trump got elected on. I bet you nobody would, I, you know what? I don't even know the answer. I do not know how Biden stands on tariffs. I don't even know how Trump stands on tariffs anymore, nor do I know why tariffs are even important. In fact, I vaguely even know what tariffs are. Is that a tax we put on goods coming in? I think it is. What you do is pick your, the 10 most important issues to you. Maybe it's foreign relations, maybe it's abortion, maybe it's tariffs, maybe it's taxes, maybe it's Black Lives Matter, maybe it's uh, education. I don't know. Pick the 10 issues most important to you and then talk about what are the critical things happening right now with those issues, like taxes. Is it, what happens when you have higher taxes? What happens when you have lower taxes? What are examples in history where a country raised taxes and did better or worse? What are examples in U.S. history where, where we lowered taxes, did worse uh, or better, higher taxes? What, what happens? What, ta what other taxes can one consider? There's income tax, but there's capital gains tax. There's VAT taxes. There's sales taxes. There's social security taxes. There's property taxes. Sometimes some candidates want a flat tax. So what are the actual issues? What experiments have been done? By the way, UBI, which is, was Yang's big issue, that's sometimes called a negative income tax that Milton Friedman came up with that term. And, and 
even though right now it's a Democrat issue, Richard Nixon was in favor of a UBI. And, you know, in Alaska, they have a UBI. So what are the, what are the actual issues? And, and you could talk about some of the history of the issue, what recent, how, you know, how did Obama, what was his philosophy on taxes? What was Bush's philosophy? What's Trump's, you know, what are their doctrines on these things or foreign relations? Every president has a different view of foreign relations. Like Trump is a bit more, I would say Trumpism on foreign relations. He's a little bit more isolationist. He doesn't believe the U S should be the police of the world. Obama, I would say Obamaism. He didn't necessarily think we were the police of the world, but he liked to have good, friendly relations with all the other industrial countries. So for him, having good, peaceful relationships and consensus was really important because he was coming off of Bush. And Bushism was probably, we should be the police of the world. Clinton, I have no idea what his foreign policies were, but he probably, my guess is he probably had a consistent one. So you could call this whatever you want. I call the book challenge smart enough to vote, but you could call it 10 issues you need to know before you vote or the 10 most important issues in the United States or whatever you want to call it. Again, pick issues, pick an issue. And then every one to three days, finish a chapter. So taxes, you could just start with Google or Wikipedia. Here's all the issues with taxes. Here's some history. And here's kind of a strong argument for or against raising taxes or lowering taxes. Here's five reforms that will help uh, in the Black Lives Matter movement. Here's, uh, you know, the problem with having too high tariffs. You could end up with the Great Depression, which happened after the Smoot-Hawley tariff, blah, blah, blah. And again, you're all going to have different issues. You're all going to have different histories of those issues. And you're all going to have different opinions on those issues. Some people are pro-life. Some people are pro-choice. Some people are pro-life for science reasons. Some for religious reasons. Some are pro-choice for feminist reasons. Some for science reasons. So, and there's a history to this. What's the history? So on and on. Here's another 30 day book challenge. I call this one weird science, but you could call this anything you want. You could say, you could call this 10 weird inventions that are going to shape the future or 10 things that are going to surprise you in 2030 or whatever you want to call it. So, but it's, I call this 30 day book challenge, weird science. What's an example of weird science? Well, have you ever heard of fecal matter transplants? So what a fecal matter transplant is, is you take your shit and you put it in the ass of another person. Sorry to be so explicit. I don't like saying the word poop or butt. <laughs> shit and ass seem more appropriate. I'll, I'll, I'll describe it in terms of this is a real science experiment. So they took the shit of a baby rat and they put it in the ass of an, a very old rat that was about to die. And then they took the shit of the old rat and put it in the baby rat. The baby rat started to exhibit features of very quick aging. And the old rat started, his lifespan was extended. He started to be youthful and run around again. And why does this work? Well, there's a lot of research being done in the gut, what's called the gut biome, like how your bacteria, which is really the original you know, in evolution, like a billion years ago, we were just a, a protoplasmic stomach, basically. So we've all evolved from the stomach. You have more brain cells in your stomach, I think, than your brain. But uh, uh, there's a lot of evidence that your, your gut bacteria influence your personality, influence your health, change your health. Uh, it's basically, you are what you eat or you are what somebody else shits. <laughs> so Fecal matter transplants, I do not believe they've done it on humans, but when they do, uh, I'm, I'm signing up for it. I'm going to get uh, a, a, a young person's shit up me and maybe I'll live forever. Who knows? So that's fecal matter transplants. It's an unusual thing in weird science. Here's another one, you know, quantum computing, could re research that. You know, right now we're about to roll out 5G for the phone networks. Well, what does 10G look like? Another thing is clones. Are clones really possible? Uh, is, is, is our time machine, you know, is, is, is warp drive from Star Trek possible? Like there's all this 
stuff from Einstein that maybe you could bend space. Could that make warp drives pop? I don't know. Weird science. Come up with your own 10 things. Tell what the science is. Describe it. Tell any scientific research that has been done on this, like I did with fecal matter transplants. And you could easily look up quantum computing and what 10 G might mean and, and uh, clones tell if there's any, how close we are, maybe tell what you would do if this, you know, tell a little story or tell a story of someone who's tried to clone themselves or who knows. So that one's called the 30 day book challenge is called weird science, but you could call it, you know, the unexpected future or, you know, 10, 10 unusual things you're going to see in 2030. Or you could say, you could just call it like fecal matter transplants and nine other um, crazy things that could save your life. Again, you'll all come up with 10 different things. You'll all, uh, you know, write up a, a chapter every two or three days, do your cover on 99designs.com, make it totally wild and scientific and hit publish. So I've given, I've given three ideas so far, the 101 technique, the smart enough to vote technique, the weird science technique. Here's a, here's a fourth one, fourth one. Uh, I call this one, what would Jesus eat? Or you could call it, what would Muhammad eat? What would Buddha eat? What would Krishna eat? What would Mother Teresa eat? What would Lao Tzu eat? What would Confucius eat? What would Moses eat? What would Socrates eat? Or you could combine all those. You could pick 10 important religious figures or people you admire and just talk about their diets. Like, uh, you know, so the book could be, so he, here's the thing. This book could be inspirational. So like if you did, what would Jesus eat? Or even if that's a chapter in your book, it could be inspirational. Like what, what were some of the quotes of Jesus that inspired you the most and why? And what would his diet be? Well, we know he lived in zero AD in the Mediterranean area. So it's probably similar to a Mediterranean, what we call a Mediterranean diet now, you know, uh, uh, rice, uh, grape leaves, feta cheese, eggplant, hummus. I don't know. I don't even know what some of the chickpeas, you know, various vegetables. And you could tell there's all sorts of uh, nutritional effects of uh, benefits of the Mediterranean diet. Uh, Dan Butner, who's been on my podcast, he wrote a book called The Blue Zones about people who live uh, about areas in the world, six areas in the world where people unnaturally live to be have high quality of life past the age of 100. And he talks about their diets in the blue zones. So it turns out the Mediterranean diet is one of those blue zone kind of diets. So it's actually a good diet. If you have a chapter, what would Jesus eat? The Jesus diet. So it's inspirational. It's a good diet. It's nutritional. There's science. There's history based. Like, well, did he eat chickpeas or did they have hummus already? Or did they have some other foods? You know, you have to research the history that was going on then. Who was ruling the different food sources and how would people get food? Like they probably didn't get steak that much. They were, were they mostly vegetarians or what meats did they eat? Did they eat goat? Did they eat lamb? I have no idea. Did they eat sheep? Wasn't he a shepherd? Uh, you know, I have no idea. Then do the same thing with Buddha, who was certainly a vegetarian or Moses, who was certainly not a vegetarian or Socrates, who I don't know what the hell he ate, or you could do it. Then you, this is great for sequels. Uh, you could do diets of the saints, diets of today's, uh, world leaders, diets of the super athletes of history. Uh, and remember it's inspirational, it's diet, it's nutrition, it's motivational, it's science, history. This is, there's so many categories where you can make this a number one Amazon bestseller. There's sequels. Just pick, pick a different one every day, start the research, write a chapter every two or three days, maybe even discuss other people now using, you know, you discuss the science of the diet. So you, so first, who is Moses? Who is Jesus? Who is Muhammad? Give some inspirational stuff. Give the diet based on historical research that you do. Give the science, like why might this diet be the best diet for you? Give maybe a story of people doing that diet and whatever, and, and then move on. And you have 10 different diets. Uh, maybe even it's a good diet to rotate through all the diets, like one month this, one month that, you know, to keep variety. So anyway, that's the 30 day book challenge. What would Jesus eat? So what have we covered? 
Last week, we did 10, sci 10 scientifically proven habits to blank. We also did what I call the religion technique. Then in this time, we did the 101 technique, smart enough to vote technique. We did what would Jesus eat and weird science. All of these are good 30-day book challenges. I'll top it off with a fifth one for the day, seventh one for this little series, which is the 30-day book of 30-day book challenges. Come up with your own 30-day book challenges and write a book of 30-day book challenges. I think that would be enormous. And I will, if you write that, I will definitely mention that and give you full credit. Heck, you know what? I just came up with this idea. I might, I'm excited. I might do this idea. So you have to beat me to it. But if I do it, I probably won't. But th the whole point is, is that these are all books that everybody could do. And I guarantee you, you will, I'm seeing it right now because probably 40 to 50 people or more have sent me their 30 day, their books from the 30 day book challenges. They are all a hundred percent different and they're all using the same broad outlines that I've been describing. All of these books could be done in 30 days. All of these books, uh, uh, are, can, you know, are easy to write, easy to research. There's opportunities for sequels. Um, they're easy to market. Like even, uh, you know, like the 101 thing, you know, that's so many sequels, 10 scientifically proven habits, so many possible sequels. What would Jesus eat? So many possible sequels. Uh, weird science. It, it definitely, there's going to be thousands of sequels. If I just Google right now, I'm going to just Google. This is the way I do research. I'm just going to Google the weirdest gadgets and let's see what I come up with. First off, it came up with the weirdest gadgets. It filled it in before I could stop it. It has the 40 weirdest products on Amazon. Uh, here's a, uh, the, well, these are not that weird, but here's the, a Mac inspired candle, meat shredder claws. Eh, I don't know. I don't like that one, but weird gadgets. Let's just say, uh, I don't even know what these things are. There's an, a DJI, DJI Osmo pocket. There's a Power Dot 2.0. There's an Ember smart, smart Mug. What's a Smart Mug? Does it tell you how much to drink? Hold on. Everything's getting smart these days. Ember, ah, this looks interesting. The Ember Temperature Control Smart bug, uh, Mug. I might need this because my coffee, I'm a slow coffee drinker and my coffee always gets cold. Boom. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna order this right now. It's ninety nine dollars, but it keeps your coffee warm. Oh, and there's a two pack here. Oh, and here's one that looks like a flashlight. Anyway, see what I mean? There's a lot of fun things you could do. By the way, what if you did uh, uh, the weirdest gadgets of all, and you sold them in your store, but you used affiliate links to actually uh, sell them? You can make money that way. That's another way to do it. Or you could do a podcast, a weird gadget uh, a month where you interview the inventor of that weird gadget. Or you could, uh, this gives me an idea. What about the 101 weirdest patents? If you go to Google patents, let's do this right now. Uh, I'm going to go to Google patents. I bet you didn't even know Google had Google patents. This is a great resource because you could find patents that are about to expire. So what should I... Jay, what should I search under Google Pants? I have to think of something weird. Jay, unmute yourself. Let me see. How about I just search toilets? <laughs> so I'm gonna let's find a weird patent on toilets. Um, so Google Pants, the automated flap and cup cleaner water saving toilet. Does that mean it saves the water from your flush and then uses that to clean the toilet? I don't know. That's um, weird. Here's a, here's a toilet flushing control apparatus granted in 1987 there's an automatic toilet flushing system patented in 1999 by john gurowitz what does it do it's an automatic toilet flushing system for use with toilets in either commercial or private dwellings it comprises of a replaceable water tank top or tank lid carrying the major components of the system the timing is adjusted so that raising and lowering of the lid of the toilet seat will not interfere with operation in the sense. Oh, okay, so it's like what you see in an airport. Maybe this is what you see in an airport where you go to the bathroom and you never have to touch anything and it uses sensors to sense when you're done and you've gotten up or you've left the stall and then it 
flushes. Right. So let me see. I'm going to Google the, this guy, the inventor, John Gurowitz. Might have to have John Gurowitz on Side Hustle Fridays to talk about how to make uh, inventions. No, I don't know. He on, I only see him about the patent. Maybe someone else had an automated patent. I don't know if he ever actually made his patent. I'm going to have to like Facebook friend him. Oh, here's something. Oh, no, that's again about a database of patents. He might never have used this patent. Oh, well, he could have made billions. Yeah. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to type in fecal. <laughs> Let's see what comes up. Indwelling fecal diverting device. Compositions for fecal floral transplantation. So this is actually so how you mix plants. Uh, Freeze-dried fecal microbiota for use in fecal microbial transplantation. Boom. This is, they're already, we're all, great minds think alike. Elect, electrical muscle stimulation to treat fecal incontinence and or pelvic prolapse. Well, that does seem like a way to get rid of constipation if I am electrocuted. Uh, one more, one more. How about, how about a time machine? I don't think that's time machine in there, man. All right, let's see. Uh, simulation system. No, 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 no. It's like they're combining real time machine learning. Right, right. Um, but yeah, no time machines. I had someone once pitch me a time machine in a, uh, a VC pitch once actually. Um, what about uh teleport come on there's got to be some some weird things here what about what about rocket oh yeah what's a what's a reason that's that's gonna be or what about nuclear no let's do rocket no, no, no. yeah, yeah. <laughs> i don't think you can do nuclear in there uh there's sixty six thousand results so i'm gonna sort by newest let's see who's working on the newest rockets advertising on autonomous or semi-autonomous vehicle exteriors so this is a patent for placing an ad on a fleet of rockets. <laughs> what? All right. I, I, you know, if basically, you know, it's like if there's vertical liftoffs, which, which Uber's working on, a lot of companies right. are working on, maybe it's advertisements in the air. Uh, let's see. All right. Uh, what was the last thing I said I was going to do? Uh, you say you have a fun one, but you didn't tell me what is that. Oh, no, I, I forgot it now. <laughs> uh, Oh, 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 no, no. You know what I wanted to do? I wanted to Google Google. What's Google up to these days? What are they patenting? Here's automatic application updates. This could be scary, this one. A method for updating an application on a mobile device includes accessing application management information on the mobile device. So this means Google is filing a patent for going onto your phone in the middle of the night going into your application and potentially the private data there. I don't know. I'm just guessing and changing the application. You know, it's kind of like how they do an operating system update, but they're doing it uh, a little bit more deeply with applications. Uh, let's just, let's find one more Google one. Let's find something really scary. Can you, I, I'm one, I'm, I wonder if you can find an Apple in the Google patents. Oh yeah. Let's see. Uh, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. You do. Uh, yeah, yeah. You can touch input cursor manipulation. We should just do a podcast about weird patents. I know. An electronic device selects content and moves selected content displayed on a touch screen. Oh, you know what it is? It's like this is pretty cool, actually. And I wish they had this on phones, but they don't. Basically, with your finger, you should be able to kind of cut and paste or move text around on the screen. And right now, no phone can do that, right? No, you can. You can. You can cut and paste like you just have to select it using your finger and then you have to click it one more time it drop menu and then you have to select cut but it doesn't so, do it automatically so this one actually though it, according to this pen it moves the text you could see the text moving around yeah. which i don't think you can do i don't think you can do no it's like you could just move the cursor around yeah here's an intelligent digital assistant in a multitasking environment oh okay maybe this is r2d2 for me mm -hmm. um uh, let's see so basically, an AI determines what your intent is. Are you, are you performing a task using a search process? Or are you doing an object managing process? I don't know what that is. But like, for instance, let's say I search on, um, you, you know, uh, Hawaii, and the intelligent assistant figures out that I'm trying to book a vacation. 
and it knows when I have a vacation blocked off in my calendar and it helps me book the vacation. I don't know, something like that. Right. Anyway, this is the, we've given six altogether between last week and this week, given six 30 day book challenges. I read you some book titles of some books that were finished. I explained some of the business model at some point in the future, not so quickly. Ne next week we'll do something completely different. It'll be another multi-million dollar business idea, which I will describe next Friday on Side Hustle Fridays. But I hope you enjoyed this. Please, please, this is really important. This is a new experiment doing these Side Hustle Fridays. I want to know if you enjoy it, if you want me to continue it, if you have any ideas for topics or if there's things specifically you want to learn or if you have questions, um, leave a review on Apple Podcasts. That helps me so much. You cannot even imagine. I, I thank you so much in advance. Let me know if you do a review. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, but also let me know if you want us to continue Side Hustle Fridays. Uh, I enjoy doing it. I'm really excited about this stuff. And I think in now in this, in this period we're going through, so many people are transitioning into different careers or industries or whatever. This stuff's more important than ever. And I'm consolidating all my ideas into these Side Hustle Fridays. So you can either leave a review or text me at 203 five nine zero eight six zero seven or tweet and and if you if you tweet about a book 30 day book challenge that you wrote and you made a book then i will retweet it and i'll talk about it here at some point and stay tuned for next week i have a huge huge idea it's 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 a multi multi billion dollar industry that doesn't even exist yet, but will exist starting right now. And I will tell you step-by-step step how to build up in that, in that industry and see you next week. Thanks so much. And don't forget, please put a review or send me a text at 203-590-8607 or tweet me at J Altucher. Your daily dose of gaming just got way more epic with the Snapdragon processor powering the Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra. Snapdragon processors give you the premium mobile experience that triggers your inner champion whenever you want, wherever you want. Get ready for edge-of-your-seat performance, advanced customizations, ultra-realistic graphics, and adrenaline-boosting speeds that have the power to move you in more ways than one. Follow us on Instagram at Snapdragon Official.